All right, welcome to a uh, lecture it is. We're uh, continuing on uh, with electrochemistry, um, whatever chapter that is, I think it's 18. Grab a couple things here. Okay, uh, let's see. So we're continuing on. Let some people in maybe. Seems like the right thing to do. There we go. All right, so. We're uh, continuing on with electrochemistry. So last time we uh, finished up uh, really talking about um, the Nernst equation. And remember that the Nernst equation is really related uh, you know, to that earlier equation that we saw uh, where E naught equals uh, RT NF uh, natural log of K, the equilibrium constant one. The Nernst equation is that, uh, that equation that we saw a couple of slides ago, I think, right here, that we used right here, that E equals E naught minus RT NF natural log of Q. Again, a reminder that sort of the purpose and when you would want to use something uh, like the Nernst equation is for a situation where something is not sort of under standard conditions. So. Uh, for example, in this particular one that we did to finish up on last time, uh, sort of the concentrations there were not standard concentrations. Remember that basically standard concentrations are usually one molar. Uh, so here, obviously, at, uh, 0.6 and 0 0.01 uh, is far from sort of one molar. Although, as I think a question was pointed out last time as well, um, the 25 degrees is sort of standard temperature, if you will. But again, there's some aspect of it, like we talked about uh, in a cell, a galvanic cell that is not under those sort of standard sets of conditions. So in this case, it's the molarity that's enough to uh, make it not standard conditions. Could be something like pressures, for example, if we're dealing with some type of gases, um, and then obviously temperature as well. So we sort of use that to figure out the effect on E of the cell by sort of playing with these things like their concentrations and so forth. And for example, in this example that we finished up on last time, what we saw was when we calculate E of the cell under sort of standard conditions where we went to the table, we used the SRP values and took cathode minus anode, uh, we saw that we had an E of the cell of about minus 0 0.04 volts. And as we've been talking about, pretty much if you have sort of a minus or a negative cell voltage, that usually means for the most part that the reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. Also would mean that reactants would be favored. Um, and that's different than obviously if you had a positive cell voltage, positive cell voltage would mean that the reaction would be spontaneous, again, leading to us to a negative delta G. And that uh, pretty much in that case, the reaction going toward the product side would be favored and uh, we would make more products. Again, all those stuff sort of ties together as we've, we've seen in some of these examples. Obviously, kind of a negative delta G would imply probably a positive voltage, positive voltage, negative delta G would imply products are favored at equilibrium and altogether that would imply a larger value of K or the equilibrium constant as opposed to all the sort of opposites of that where we would have a positive delta G, a negative cell voltage would favor the reactants and a smaller value for K. So in this particular example, like we did by really uh, having those concentrations sort of change a little bit, uh, the 0.6 and the 0 0.01, and put it into our Nernst equation, we actually do see that we gain some positive voltage here, 0 0.013, not a lot of voltage, but technically it, it did get to sort of a positive voltage, which would lead it to us understanding that perhaps it is a spontaneous reaction in this case. And again, products would be favored. So 
sort of a, a way, I guess you could kind of look at it that you can make a sort of non-spontaneous process, maybe get it to become spontaneous uh, by playing with something like uh, concentrations, uh, again, pressures, even temperatures, you could kind of play with it. Any questions on any of that stuff that we talked about, I think, last time? We also saw, again, with uh, the Nernst equation and then also with that other equation there that had the, the equilibrium constant in it, uh, there was a couple of those sort of uh, reduced down versions of it. Um, and again, as we mentioned, you could use either one of those um, and you should get relatively the same answer. And But just so you're clear, you should only use those if it is 25 degrees Celsius. If it's not 25 degrees Celsius, then you shouldn't use those sort of reduced down ones. Uh, because those are for kind of specifically at 25 degrees Celsius. As we saw, you could always just plug it in like I did here. And I think on the, the previous example as well, and you know, you will get pretty much the same one. And we talked a little bit about it yesterday as well. Um, you may get some very, a little bit of variation in terms of the number, depending sort of how you round it. And again, especially when you're dealing with natural logs and logs and things of that nature, or to even take the inverse of those guys, you know, just rounding a little bit does make sort of a, a difference uh, in terms of the answer. But uh, typically speaking, um, you know, if you're going for like a, an equilibrium constant or something like that, uh, usually the exponent part will be pretty much the same, just the front part may be slightly different depending on rounding. Any questions on any of that stuff there? Okay, so then we're gonna talk a little bit about batteries and uh, we're gonna see some different types of batteries and I believe we did this one, right? Oops. Or did we, we didn't do this one, did we? No? So why don't we do this one? How's that? <laughs> I think we slept off there, right? So we have this one. So let's do this one first before we get the batteries. So let's do one more. So why don't you give that a go and see what you come up with.
And you could assume this is 25 degrees even, it doesn't say. Okay, so let's kind of see how we're doing here. So we want to calculate E, uh, E naught, and K here. So again, as we, we've seen some different sort of formulas and equations to use, and you know, sort of based on what's being asked and the information given to you as to sort of what you should use. So really the, the only one that we saw uh, that sort of had K involved in it is our uh, E naught, equals RTNF, natural log of K, uh, and that's RTNF, natural log of K. Obviously, you can use any of those sort of reduced down ones because it is 25 degrees as well. Again, a reminder that really, you know, it, it does sort of come from the nurse equation here um, that we saw earlier. And because we're dealing with equilibrium, E would equal zero at equilibrium. And Q would become K if we're at equilibrium. And again, that's basically how we go from here back to that equation that we saw earlier. So we're looking for K in this case. We're also looking for E, which we can solve for. RT again here we have, F is a constant, N we could figure out as well. So a couple of things we want to think about is, uh, you know, what is our cathode, what is our anode? Uh, in this case, we are given a reaction. So it may, the easiest one might be for you to look at this guy. He's going from plus two to plus three. So he is going through oxidation, right? Which means he should be our anode. So this should be our anode. This should be our cathode in this particular case. You might be wondering what's going on on the other one. It's a good question. Let's see. Uh, we'll start over here maybe. This is minus two, so that's minus six. So uh, we, got, we got there, minus six, so plus four, but there's two of them. So like a plus two perhaps going on there. Over here, this guy is minus two, so that's minus 12. Less two is minus 10, and 10 divided by four in this case is actually 2.5. He's actually going from 2.5 to two. So again, if you look at your um, number line there, he started at two and he actually is going in this direction just a bit to 2.5. He's actually getting reduced in that particular case. The other way that might be easier that we also talked about definition of oxidation and reduction is the definition of sort of oxygen, if you will. Um, so it, overall sort of a decrease in oxygen happening as you go from left to right with the sulfur. And that's again a definition of reduction as, as well. All right, so now that we have our anode or cathode, that also helps us by determining what we need to kind of flip around. So if we uh, take our cathode, which is S4O6 two minus, plus our two electrons that we had, right? Yep, our two electrons going to our 2S2O3 2 minus. Again, E naught here would be 0 0.17 volts. We found out that the chromium is our anode, so we need to flip that reaction. So we're gonna get Cr3 plus plus an electron going to Cr2 plus. I just wrote that the wrong way, so let me try that again. Uh, that's good they made erasers. <laughs> Let me try to actually flip that this time and see how we do. So 
All right, let's try actually flipping it here. Or what did I have it flipped? I'm not sure. Let me see. So CR2 plus going to 2CR3 plus plus two electrons. Here I did need to multiply everybody by two to get the right number of electrons. And my E naught in this case, since I flipped it, now becomes 0 0.50 volts. Remember that even though you need a multiply, it will not have an effect on the E value, but we do need to change the sign because we reversed it. And now our electrons will cancel, giving us our balance equation of this plus this going to this plus that. Now, in terms of E of the cell, since I actually changed the signs here, I could just add those numbers together. And again, here I changed the signs. So when I add those together, looks like 0 0.67 volts would be our E of the cell. Any questions on that move right there? And now looking back to sort of our equation that we're looking for, E naught uh, equals RT, nf natural log of k again here n is going to equal two as we can see from what we crossed out t is needs to be converted obviously to kelvin which is 298 kelvin and that's everybody else that we need so basically we have 0 0.67 equals 8.314 which is our r our 298 divided by our two moles and F being our Faraday's constant. And that's gonna be the natural log of K. This is obviously volts on this side. If we do some cleaning up here, let's see. I'm gonna take care of everything on the right-hand side before the natural log part and try to clean everything up. And if you do everything on the right-hand side, you get something like 0 0.0128, which then I want to divide 0.67 by that number. And if I do that, let's see here. So on this side here, we ended up with 0. 0 0.0128 natural log of K equals 0 0.67 volts. Dividing it over gets us 52.19 with some more decimals there, natural log of K. We're going to take the E of both sides. And that gives us a K value of, yeah, we'll call it, 4.6 times 10 to the 22. And again, uh, depending on rounding, and if you use one of the other formulas, you might have got a slightly different front number, but the 22 part probably should be uh, right on in that case. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> Now, a couple things here does agree, right? So we got a positive E, uh, which means reaction should be spontaneous, should be heading towards products. And that means we should have a large value of K, which we obviously do in this particular case. Any questions on that calculation there? All right. Now I think we'll get into batteries. So talk a little bit about batteries. Uh, we're gonna see some different types of batteries. Um, you're not gonna really be asked to write any of the uh, sort of half reactions or anything like that for any specific battery. Um, just sort of a general, we're gonna go through some different types and some characteristics of it. But basically what you need to know is sort of, uh, you know, a battery, how it's similar to a traditional galvanic cell and you know, how it sort of varies a little bit from a traditional galvanic cell. Again, not gonna be asked to do any sort of uh, specific equations for any specific um, batteries that we see. All right, so let's talk a little bit about batteries. Uh, batteries basically are galvanic cells, or basically you could do a series of galvanic cells sort of together. 
um, as a source of sort of direct current at constant voltage. Um, they are essentially redox reactions. They are essentially really sort of galvanic cells like you could build in the laboratory uh, out of beakers and so forth. Um, again, if you look in a battery compartment, right, there's usually a wire in there, right? And as the reaction takes place, electrons kind of go out through the wire. Again, do some type of work, like power your device and come back around. Now, they're self-contained, uh, which is obviously a, a major difference between that and say, you know, a galvanic cell and beakers, right? You can't really squeeze all the beakers into your battery compartment, probably not gonna work very well for you. Uh, so they're really self-contained. They also have really uh, no need for a salt bridge. They kind of use some other things that act like a salt bridge, um, but obviously there's not that traditional bridge that kind of connects one side to the next as sort of a separate component. So batteries are really self-contained sort of galvanic cells. They, uh, they basically function very similar, uh, but the difference is that, like I said, the battery is more self-contained um, and obviously allows a little bit more wide variety of use than trying to, like I said, put beakers and things. So let's take a look at some different types of uh, batteries and some of the reactions that we see. Uh, for example, here, I'm not sure which one that might be, perhaps the copper top there, right, Duracell. Uh, this is a type of cell which is sometimes referred to as a dry cell. Uh, it basically has a cell without sort of a fluid compartment like you typically would have in a, a normal galvanic cell. Here, the anode part of the battery is the zinc can, our container and it's in contact with MnO2 and a sort of strong electrolyte in the middle. Um, the cathode is basically a carbon rod that's immersed in the uh, sort of center through here, right? So we have our zinc anode, right? Negative side, right? Going as electrons would travel out, right? Away from that negative side to the positive side, right? Obviously as it's doing that, it's going through your device or whatever you're powering, right? To sort of help that all occur. Um, in addition here in the middle, we have a uh, sort of some uh, paper, we have a layer of MnO2, we also have some paste of zinc chloride and ammonium chloride in there, again sort of acting as the electrolyte. So this kind of pasty area in here, sort of acting really like the salt bridge in a traditional galvanic cell, helping to keep, again, those are very ionic compounds, right? So those ions are gonna help everything continue to basically flow. The voltage for this type of cell, no matter sort of what size you get, right? They come in uh, Cs, Ds, you know, double A's, triple A's, right? They all have really the same voltage. They all give 1.5 in terms of the voltage. Um, but the difference is obviously in the size. So different sizes have potential obviously to last longer and allow this reaction to occur longer. So if we kind of look at our half reactions here, we see our anode side or zinc going from zero to plus two and obviously going through oxidation in that case. And <clears throat> If we look at something, for example, like the MnO2, it is going from plus four here, and over on this side, it is plus three, so reduction occurring there um, between those two guys happening on our cathode side. Overall reaction is what we get when we sort of add everything together, and again, oxidation part, reduction part occurring there. Now, one thing that you'll notice sort of in the overall reaction here with this type of battery, as opposed to some that we'll see a little bit down the road here is, there is a few solids that are there, but there's a lot of aqueous stuff. Uh, there's a lot of sort of liquid involved there like water. And, you know, having things in the overall reaction as we will see where you end up with a lot of solids there really helps make a battery sort of longer lasting, if you will because uh, you're sort of regenerating a lot of the solid components. Here, obviously, with things that are sort of aqueous and so forth, it has a tendency to leak, right? All that battery acid and stuff comes out of battery sometimes, right? And uh, obviously, that will affect how good the battery will be able to perform over time. Another type of battery is a mercury battery. And <clears throat> in terms of the mercury battery here, 
Uh, it's used a lot in uh, medicine and electronic sort of devices, um, more expensive than the previous type of battery. It also contains sort of a zinc can as your anode, and it has sort of a steel uh, part here that is your cathode. Um, so it's a zinc anode in contact with mercury um, in a strongly alkaline electrolyte solution. So remember that alkaline means basic. So something that is strongly alkaline means that's a strong base and a very good electrolyte, right? So that would be a very good electrolyte like potassium hydroxide. Again, sort of your functioning salt bridge that's contained inside. Again, something like that is gonna generate enough ions to keep everything continuing going and going overall. And when you look at the overall reaction, it involves really only solid substances, which I just mentioned a second ago, is sort of a hallmark of batteries being very long lasting. So making things that overall have those sort of solid components, the idea there is probably less likely solid components is gonna drop out of the battery, right? As opposed to something that's in the aqueous phase or something like that has a greater tendency to ooze out, if you will, obviously not allowing it to work as good for a long period of time. The voltage here is a little bit less, is 1.35 volts typically in this type of battery. And again, if we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if we look at what's happening here, we have our zinc, uh, which is going from zero to plus two, again, going through oxidation. And uh, in this particular case, this is mercury two. And this is our um, mercury with no charge. So plus two to zero, gaining electrons going through oxidation. But again, the key part here is the overall reaction, pretty much all solids, a little bit of liquid there. And again, that is very good in terms of long lasting and sort of durability of, of batteries. A lead storage battery is another type of battery that you're probably familiar with in your car, right? So these are typically the kinds that we uh, would use in cars. And um, they have six identical cells joined together in a series. And each cell gives about two volts. So if you got six of them, that's your 12 volt battery that you typically need in your car. Both the anode and cathode are immersed in an aqueous sulfuric acid. Uh, solution. Sulfuric acid also being another strong acid, which means again, it's going to be a very good electrolyte, again, really acting as sort of the um, salt bridge there between everything and keeping everything flowing. And at 12 volts, that is enough, right, to turn on your car, start your car, get the electrical system going on every day, except for the day where you're running late and your car won't start when you turn it. And then you go, wow, I hope it's the battery and maybe not the alternator or something like that, right? Um, and we do have, uh, you know, things like uh, alternators and other things that will help us not deplete the battery, right? So as we sort of drive our car, we're sort of recharging the battery a little bit as we go through uh, in a traditional sort of uh, battery that you find in a car. And again, we're able to do that by really reversing uh, <clears throat> that electrochemical process and uh, applying an external voltage, again, uh, to the cathode and the anode. You could check your healthy battery by its density. Uh, usually 1.2 grams per milliliter is, is a good one. Um, in cold weather, sometimes that gets a little bit more viscous, so you don't have those electrolytes flowing as well as they should and it results in obviously a little less power than you would in maybe a, a warmer environment where you know obviously everybody's able to move around those charges in the electrolyte part of it very well. Here's sort of a cross section of a traditional car battery. And again, you can see you basically have a series of cells hooked up together. We have our cathode, which is our positive guy. We have our anode, which is our negative guy. And again, um, Nowadays, batteries are not even necessarily in the engine anymore. Uh, a lot of them are in the trunk sometimes under the back seat, but you still have the little clips in case you need to jump your car or jump a battery uh, in the engine. But oddly, a lot of times they've moved a lot of the batteries not actually in the engine compartment anymore. 
Uh, you can see as well, an electrolyte solution, hence the term battery acid, right? When we talk about those things um, that people refer to sometimes. And um, this is always the, the decision to make, right? When you got the jumper cables, right? The red one goes where, you know, where's the black one go? You know, we're not really sure, you know, so double check that before you do that or use those things. Anode reaction here, we have our lead going from zero to plus two, so going through oxidation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then on the, uh, the product side here, uh, we have our lead that's going from plus four over here, right? So that is lead four oxide going to lead two sulfide over here. So plus four to plus two going through reduction in that particular case. And again, some durability, obviously on something like a car battery, we do see a lot of solid guys in our overall reaction, except for obviously our battery acid, which at some point can go down and our battery not working as well. But a majority of it is solid, which again is very good for sort of the rechargeability aspect of a battery. This is a uh, lithium, solid state lithium battery. Um, and on the anode side, it has some type of carbon graphite material. Usually it has some type of holes in it that allows really these lithium guys to kind of travel through to the other side. On the cathode side, we have some type of transition metal uh, like cobalt four oxide um, that can also hold some lithium ions in it. Um, lithium is very uh, useful in terms of batteries. Uh, they can be charged hundreds of times without deterioration. A lot of solid leftover in this sort of process. A lot of lithium batteries, right, on tools we used to have, right? And they're also lithium is a light metal as well. Um, so it's not as heavy and it makes for those kind of cordless tools and those batteries to be a lot useful in that sense. Another type of cell, which is technically really not a battery, but uh, sometimes always sort of uh, put in this sort of genre, if you will. And this is a, a fuel cell. This is, happens to be a hydrogen fuel cell. And this is sort of what years and years ago, right? Everybody was thinking, well, we'll just switch over cars to sort of these type of guys in terms of hydrogen fuel cells. And basically in this case, we have basically our traditional sort of cell set up, but we're shooting in hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Obviously, as we talked about, we'll need something to be used as sort of a sort of physical anode if you're gonna sort of do it in the laboratory. So that's why this is something like carbon here, or graphite again is sometimes referred to. Um, so on our anode side, we have our Hydrogen going from zero at the H2 to plus one on the other side. And obviously on our cathode side, we have the oxygen going from zero to minus two on the other side. The benefit of this one and the reason why people kind of were hoping to kind of transition to this is the overall reaction that's obviously occurring here in this fuel cell is basically the formation of water, which obviously would not hurt too much in terms of the environment and so forth. Um, but as we know, we are definitely not a hydrogen economy and uh, obviously pumping in hydrogen and, and gases like that um, are very different than sort of our traditional gasoline and, and gas stations. And, you know, we've now obviously have moved more towards electric or hybrid type vehicles uh, instead of sort of these type of guys here where they use these sort of fuel cells uh, to do this. So again, uh, that's just a little bit about batteries and I'm not gonna ask you, like I said, any specific reactions or anything about that in terms of uh, batteries. Um, specifically, you just need to know, again, a little bit about batteries, a little bit again, how they are sort of similar to galvanic cells, a traditional one in the laboratory versus and how they're a little bit maybe different um, than the ones you would build in the laboratory. And that sort of uh, idea also goes with what we're gonna talk about next, which is corrosion. So again, uh, in terms of corrosion, you just need a sort of a, a general idea of, of what's going on with corrosion. We're gonna talk about um, what sort of happens 
and also, as we will see, maybe some ways to sort of prevent corrosion. So that's sort of what you'll need to know from the stuff uh, we're going to talk about right now. So let's get into corrosion then. Um, <clears throat> So corrosion really is sort of returning metals uh, to sort of their natural state. Really for a lack of a uh, best definition, it's pretty much metals that go through oxidation reactions. So metals that get oxidized go through corrosion. And for example, a fifth of the steel produced is to replace sort of rusted metals. That was a while ago, that statistic is probably pretty still close to that I imagine. And when we think about metals and metals that basically will go through corrosion, it's really all metals that have a SRP value that's less positive than oxygen. So let's just take a moment and think about what that means. So SRP values, or that standard reduction potential values that we talked about uh, in this chapter and obviously in that table. And if you remember that when we look at those SRP values, the more positive guy is going to be your cathode, right? And the more positive guy is going to be your cathode, that is where reduction would take place. Which means that if you have a metal that is less positive than oxygen, that metal, when it combines with oxygen, will become the anode and thus go through oxidation. So, any metal that basically has an SRP value that's less than O2, and we talk about oxygen because obviously oxygen is flying around in the air, right? So it is the one that's gonna basically be causing this oxidation to occur. It's going to be basically the oxidizing agent, right? Since it's going through reduction. And we would expect probably some appreciable oxidation to occur and corrosion to occur in metals with that. And that's because, again, when we do that, we will get basically a positive value for E. And that positive value for E of the cell will give us, as we've been talking about, a negative value for G, which means that the reaction should be spontaneous, which means just sitting out there in air, spontaneously, they should start to go through oxidation and should start to go through corrosion. Now, not all corrosion and oxidation of metals is necessarily a bad thing. It can actually be a, a good thing in certain cases. And that's because when these guys go through oxidation, they tend to form these thin oxides that actually puts a layer of protection over the metal. And if it is able to form this sort of layer of protection as it goes through corrosion, it is actually protecting the metal that's underneath it. So if you had your metal and this guy goes through some corrosion, and it's maybe not such a bad thing in this guy's case, it's gonna create this layer on top, right, of this oxide layer. And what that's gonna prevent is further oxygen from reaching the metal. And thus, it actually would stop further corrosion in that case. So again, not all corrosion or oxidation of metals is a terrible thing. Uh, for example, aluminum there will make an aluminum oxide, which basically will prevent that further corrosion. The reason we typically think about corrosion of metals as sort of a bad thing and always, you know, not the greatest situation is because we typically think about corrosion in the sense of iron. And iron does go through corrosion. The same thing happens. But the problem is when we form that rust, which is what happens with iron, it has a tendency to fall off. And when we do something like iron here, and we make that little layer of protection, unfortunately it falls off. And that exposes obviously new iron here underneath that to further corrosion, which will eventually fall off, further corrosion fall off. And obviously that eventually will sort of eat through the iron, right? And we think about it as being basically rusted out, right? And that's why, you know, we oftentimes think about corrosion and rust and all that obviously as bad sort of thing. But again, in some cases, it actually can be protective. In the case of iron, it is obviously not protected because it sort of falls off, allowing new metal underneath of it to continue that corrosion process until you basically eat through it. 
Copper, on the other hand, uh, does form a nice layer of that patina color that we typically associate with it, that greenish carbonate, which again, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, some people pay a lot of money, right, to get things sort of patinaed in that sort of greenish uh, color that comes about. Silver tarnishes, that's silver sulfide. Um, as we have experienced in our last couple of qualitative analysis with sulfur, and we saw a lot of it sort of developing, a lot of sulfur sort of products, right, are sort of dark in color. So you have a lot of sort of uh, solids that are brown, black, you know, so sort of those darker colors. Uh, obviously, if you've seen tarnish on silver, it sort of has that sort of color to it as well. Now, gold, which has an SRP value of 1.5, is larger than oxygen. So it typically will not go through too much corrosion in air. And again, in the situation of gold, if, again, if we think about our SRP values, and our more positive guy being our cathode, that's gonna go through reduction, while our more negative guy is gonna be the anode and go through oxidation. When gold and oxygen hook up, because gold has a larger, more positive, I guess a more positive way of saying that, more positive SRP value, the gold is gonna end up being the cathode while the oxygen will be the anode. Thus, gold will not go through oxidation when those two come together because of its SRP value. And just to touch upon steel a little bit here, again, uh, the rust aspect of it, pretty much what you need for rust to form is you need some iron, a little bit of moisture, and obviously some oxygen from the air. And really, a sort of a two-stage process the iron actually gets oxidized to iron two, and then further gets oxidized down to iron three and making our iron three oxide, which is what rust is. Again, sort of, there's a lot of non-uniform parts on steel that makes little kind of divots, if you will, and nice areas where moisture can collect, oxygen can get in there, and it just kind of makes sort of a breeding ground for rust to sort of form. And obviously, as we've been talking about, that is bad sort of corrosion because it will fall off and obviously allow more corrosion to occur. Here's a much prettier picture maybe than I would have drawn. But again, on steel, we have these kind of non-uniform points here. And obviously, that allows a lot of moisture to kind of sit in those areas. And obviously, the air is providing a lot of oxygen and it's just going to allow this sort of oxidation reaction of oxygen, of I'm sorry, of iron to form iron three oxide and the pile up. And then at some point, again, that rust will sort of fall apart, right? We help it along a lot of times, right? We can look at it and go, oh, is that rusty? And we start playing with it, right? And it starts falling off and we're actually making it worse, right? Because we're now exposing more of the metal underneath all that stuff. And again, that process will kind of continue. I see the money over here, so it must cost a lot of money to replace, and obviously does cost a lot of money to replace a lot of this stuff that gets sort of corroded out. So let's talk a little bit about some ways that you can prevent corrosion from happening, or ways that you could sort of help it to be minimized. So obviously there's a few different ways that you can go about helping corrosion. I guess not helping corrosion, help prevent it, I guess is a better way of saying that. Obviously, some type of coating is, is a good way to prevent corrosion from occurring. Uh, paint, uh, metal plating, they sell, what is that at Home Depot? Rust-Oleum paint, they've sold for who knows how long. It's even in the name, Rust-Oleum, right? So probably try to prevent rusting. We've all taken a can of Rust-Oleum paint and sprayed something off and go, looks good for one season until it obviously needs to be painted again and the, the stuff comes back. Um, plating again is another way that you can sort of prevent corrosion from happening. Um, chromium tin is used to plate steel and that's because they oxidize and they form an effective coating. So here in that case, what we're doing is putting on a coating a protective layer that's going to prevent the metal from underneath from further going through corrosion. The same thing happens when we use zinc and galvanizing. Again, the idea here is the zinc is a more active metal than iron, so it provides this sort of coating on it. 
And when we say that zinc versus iron, when we look at the SRP values here, iron is minus 0.44 volts. The zinc here is minus 0.76 volts. So if we were just had a straight galvanic cell question, you would tell me that the iron here is more positive in this case. So it's going to act as the cathode while the zinc here would act as our anode. And that would mean when we do this process, the cathode is where our reduction would take place. All of the bad oxidation is gonna take place here on the surface where the zinc is. So all that oxidation is gonna occur on the zinc, thus protecting the iron that's underneath it because we've used those SRP values to our advantage here. So as it says there, zinc sort of acts as a sacrificial sort of coating for it. Again, keeping all the bad oxidation happening here, which is good because probably your main structure is built off of iron over here, uh, whatever you coated. Um, and again, protecting the iron from going through any significant amount of oxidation. Uh, alloying is another way. Uh, so stainless steel contains chromium and nickel. Again, they both form these oxide coatings and it basically changes the reduction potential of, of uh, sort of the stainless steel to a noble metal. And noble metals, if you're familiar with, is like gold, platinum, right, silver. These are guys that basically there's no appreciate, appreciation in terms of uh, oxidation that occurs with those guys. So uh, like we saw with the gold, it has an SRP value greater are more positive, keep saying greater, more positive than uh, the oxygen and thus protected from going through oxidation. Any questions on that there? Okay. Another type of protection is one here. This is what is known as cathodic protection. So for example, if you connect magnesium uh, by a wire to a pipeline or tank uh, that may be made out of iron, for example, uh, the magnesium will basically protect the iron that's in a tank. So like a storage tank, like gas and stuff like that, that they bury under the ground, right? That is sort of a worse situation as well. When you bury a big tank underground, there is a ton of moisture down there, right? There's oxygen and you just buried it out there. So you would tend to have a, a very big problem in terms of rusting that would occur if you didn't do anything to that. So the reason why this sort of process works as well is magnesium is a better reducing agent than iron. So again, some words that we heard about before in this chapter, magnesium, a better reducing agent than iron. Reducing agent, if you remember from our conversations, which I hope you do, a reducing agent is the substance that goes through oxidation. So that means if it's a better reducing agent than iron, all again, the bad oxidation that's going to occur, is gonna occur over here on the magnesium, thus by default here, protecting the iron from going through any significant amount of oxidation, which is a really good thing. If you bury a tank underground, you don't wanna to have to go dig it up every week, right? As, if, as it goes through and gets rusted out. So it provides a pretty good durable way of allowing you to sort of use a, a tank like that and sort of bury it and keep it there for a good period of time as again all the bad stuff sort of happens over here at the magnesium. Uh, titanium and ships are used uh, again uh, in salt water the titanium gets sort of oxidized first uh, before your ship hopefully uh, so your ship doesn't fall apart while you're on the water also probably not a great thing I'm imagining. So here's sort of a picture of that again you know, without this sort of guy acting as a sacrificial sort of uh, cathode there, um, <clears throat> this guy, again, is in a situation where there's got to be a lot of moisture underground. There's obviously a lot of iron in there, and there's obviously some oxygen. So with nothing there, this guy would be pretty ripe to start to go through corrosion. But again, by having this magnesium there, all of the bad oxidation is gonna occur over here, leaving our tank to be happy underneath the ground for at least a good couple of years. Any questions on that? 
So in terms of corrosion, just to sort of uh, sum up what you need to know, um, you need to know A, what corrosion is, uh, B, a couple of ways that you can sort of prevent corrosion from happening. And I think that's sufficient. Any questions on any of that there? Okay. So the last thing we're gonna talk about in this chapter here is we're gonna talk about electrolysis. And up to now, we started of talking about galvanic cells and sort of spontaneous reactions occurring. And what we're gonna talk about now is electrolysis. And electrolysis is really making a sort of non-spontaneous reaction occur. And we make a non-spontaneous reaction occur <clears throat> by uh, providing an electrical current. So let's take a look at that. So electrolysis is really sort of a process where by supplying an electrical current, we could cause really a non-spontaneous reaction to occur. So for example here, this is sodium chloride, and we know sodium chloride is salt, and we know that it is a non-spontaneous process, right? That if you take something like sodium chloride or salt, and you want it to basically break that thing back into its components, its elements, chlorine gas, right? We do not spontaneously get sodium metal and chlorine gas to just come out under normal conditions, which is good because then when we go to in and out and get our fries, you don't really put too much salt on fries, do they? But wherever you go and get your fries, right? It would be a bad situation, right? You bite into it, you'll spontaneously get some sodium metal and chlorine, toxic green gas. Probably doesn't happen too much, right? So that's definitely a process that doesn't naturally occur. And we can make this sort of non-spontaneous process occur by providing an electrical current here. And by providing an electrical current, we essentially can put in our sodium chloride and actually get liquid sodium out and also chlorine gas to basically come out by reversing that non-spontaneous process. So sort of when you get those E values that are for cells negative, if you sort of take your anode and your cathode in and basically flop them around, that negative value will become a positive value. And that's essentially what you're doing here. You're sort of driving the reaction the opposite way by providing that extra electrical current. So you can see here in this process, we're taking the chloride ion and it is going from minus one to zero here in terms of our oxidation state. And again, on that number line, started at minus one, headed to uh, zero, and it is going through oxidation in this electrolysis cell. While the sodium is starting at plus one and heading to zero, so it is starting over here and heading in this direction and going through a reduction. So my point in this electrical current is going to help bring those electrons from the chloride back over to the sodium and the sodium can gain those electrons. And that is sort of opposite of what sort of happens, right? When we put these together, when we put sodium chloride together, the sodium is losing the metal, losing the metal, losing the electrons, right, to the chlorine. And really when we put sodium chloride together in the ionic form, it is the sodium that is going to Na plus and an electron going off, which again, if we balance it here with the twos, that is the opposite of what's happening here in the electrolysis reaction. So that naturally occurring thing where we kind of put it together to make the sodium chloride, to reverse it, we need to help it along and provide that current. Same thing with our chlorine. And when we make sodium chloride, it is actually this guy gaining some electrons and making two of these guys, right? And again, that is the opposite of what's happening here in our oxidation reaction. So sort of opposite of what happens in a spontaneous process when we can make sodium chloride or this particular compound in general. And uh, 
we need to sort of supply that electrical current to help that sort of reverse reaction take place. Electrolysis of water is another one here. The electrolysis of water <clears throat> occurs here. And as you can see, same idea. We also know naturally we have water and naturally we just don't really produce spontaneously again hydrogen gas and oxygen gas otherwise it would be a very terrible thing to boil water for noodles because you probably would never get there at that point if you produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas so that doesn't normally happen and you can apply electrical current uh, to water to do this you could actually do it in if you took uh, chem 3 here at Saddleback you did this I probably provided you didn't take it here it's for this last spring but if you took it before uh, you did this reaction I don't remember if they do it in 1a or not but uh, you take the nine volt batteries they usually have the ones the big Amazon battery ones that they use uh, you, you hook it up um, you know like a little tube with some water you get some acidic water to do it you plug in the nine volt battery and the electrodes will start to uh, bubble up that water and you'll make hydrogen gas and oxygen gas in this case. Again, the oxidation here uh, is occurring as we go from uh, minus two to zero in terms of the oxygen, right? And the reduction here, plus one to zero here uh, happening with our hydrogen. And you may notice that if you do it in a test tube, which is similar to what you did in Chem 3 with very smaller test tubes, you'll see these empty spaces in the test tubes. Those empty spaces in test tubes are really not empty. It actually has gas in it, has hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And that is typically what you see there is you see you actually have more hydrogen gas than oxygen. And that is because water is H2O. So you got twice as much hydrogen as you do oxygen typically develops when you bubble it out. All those bubbles on the right-hand side, oxygen gas, and on the left-hand side in that picture there is the hydrogen gas. You also see that they typically use dilute, hydro, dilute sulfuric acid. And really the sulfuric acid or some type of acidic water, which if you remember that experiment from Chem 3, they had a big bottle, big jug of acidic water and the acidic water really provides a good amount of H plus that's sort of needed to keep this reaction occurring. So a couple of things about these reactions that you see on the screen here and the thing where it says sulfuric acid. Sometimes when you read problems in books in terms of uh, electrolysis problems, especially the electrolysis of water, they oftentimes will not just straight out say, hey, we're doing the electrolysis of water with blinking lights and all that kind of stuff. They'll say something about sulfuric acid, something about acidic water, maybe they may even say water, but usually they'll mention something about an acid. And if that's all they sort of mention, they are probably talking about the electrolysis of water, and it is these half reactions that we see here that are basically involved in any type of calculation that you need. So water is kind of an unusual one they sometimes will not just you know in, in big neon lights go hey we're doing the electrolysis of the water they'll almost hide it in terms of like we're doing it with like sulfuric acid like sulfuric acid was run in electrolysis cell and again uh, the implication of that is that they're probably talking about the electrolysis of water so let's talk about some calculations that we typically do involving electrolysis and there's really sort of uh, two types or places where we are uh, ways to do these calculations. One is from the top to the bottom and the other way around, obviously going the opposite way. But typically they will give you the current uh, in amps and the time that the cell is run for. So they'll typically say, hey, you ran the cell at 4.2 amps for like three hours. So they'll typically give you this type of information and say, hey, you, you ran this electrolysis cell for that long. Now, a charge is equal to a current, an amp, times a second. So this relationship is important because if we rearrange this and solve for an amp, amperage, which is basically what they give the current in, an amp is a coulomb over a second. Our coulomb 
is going to be used here with this guy, which you may remember is Faraday's constant. And that's that 96,500 number that we saw earlier in this chapter. So typically what you wanna do is uh, because an amperage is in seconds, whatever time they give you, you typically wanna to convert to seconds. So everything cancels out in terms of units. Um, and once you do that, you will basically get the charge that is there. And then you could use the charge in Coulombs and Faraday's constant to figure out how many moles of electrons that you have. And at this point, this is where the oxidation half reaction or the reduction half reaction will come into play. So for example, if we were looking at our chloride, for example, here that we saw. And again, our chloride going from minus one to zero, going through oxidation, which is what we saw right there, right? Our chloride going uh, to Cl2 plus 2E minus. And if we were interested in, for example, if we ran this cell, how much chlorine gas we would make. This is where we would know the moles of electrons and we could do like a stoichiometry. And in this particular case, we could say for every two moles of electrons, we get one mole of Cl2. So there's sort of like a mole to mole relationship that occurs between the half reactions, which is why you wanna make sure that they're balanced and the moles of whatever you're interested in. And once we get the moles of electrons, that will now allow us to get to say moles of Cl2. And the last part here does sort of vary depending on what you're dealing with. You could simply, once you have the moles, use the molar mass and figure out how many grams of Cl2 you would produce. Oftentimes that's used for like a metal to so figure out how much solid you would make. But since something like chlorine is also a gas, we could figure out the volume of chlorine gas we would produce. And since it's a gas and volume and gas, that should bring up memories of our good friend PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law, where sometimes you may have to use the ideal gas law to solve for volume, NRT divided by P. Just a reminder, right, uh, P has to be in atmospheres in the ideal gas law, T has to be in Kelvin, V has to be in liters, R is the gas constant, but it is the 0 0.08206 version of it. And PV, do, 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 I think that's all of it there. Pressure, volume, temperature, R, and N obviously should be in moles. So the ending part of the calculation may ask you to find grams, may ask you to find volume if it's a gas, and sometimes you have to use the ideal gas law. But that's usually the steps. You want to take the time they give you, get it to seconds, T multiply the seconds times the amperage, which will give you the coulombs. Use Faraday's constant to go from coulombs to moles of electrons, and then go from the balanced half reaction uh, to go from moles of electrons to moles of whatever you're interested in. And then you can basically figure out, uh, you know, what you're looking for in terms of grams or volume or whatever it may be. So let's take a look at one here, maybe do it together just to kind of see. Let's see here. Actually, I'm gonna, let's get that one real quick. Let's go to this one first and let's see this one here and just to kind of see how it all works. So we wanna know how much calcium can be produced in a electrolytic cell a molten calcium chloride at a current of 0.452 amps and it's passed through that cell for 1.5 hours. So if you weren't given these half reactions here, what you want to think about is I'm not doing that. You want to think about maybe a pen. You want to think about what is happening here with the calcium chloride. When I have calcium chloride in its normal sort of state, if you will. It is really calcium with a plus two charge and two of these Cl minuses. 
Now, if I want to produce solid calcium, that means that the calcium needs to be on the product side and the calcium with a charge needs to be on the reactant side. And basically I'm going from plus two to zero, which means it's gaining electrons. And that is how I know this is the reaction I'm looking at on the cathode side. Just like here, if I was interested in the chlorine gas that was going to be produced, I know that if I want to produce chlorine gas, that's going to be my product. And I'm starting with Cl minus. And in this case, it is going from minus one to zero. And it is going through oxidation, which means it should be losing a couple of electrons. And that's how you can reconstruct the anode reaction here. Because this is a electrolysis cell, you're basically almost going to be making the elemental forms of those ionic compounds. So that's how you could kind of figure out, you know, what's the anode, what's the cathode in this particular case. Any questions though on that? So let's take a look about what's given to us. We are going to run the cell at 0.452 amps. And that is the same as 0.52 coulombs per second. Yeah, so uh, let me explain it one more time how we sort of got to these half reactions if they weren't given to you. By the way, you could probably just look up it on an SRP table and turn the reaction to the right way and you'll be okay. But essentially what, what you wanna think about is we're starting with an ionic compound, this calcium chloride. And really an ionic compound, as you know, are two ions, which is calcium ion and chloride ion. And in this particular one, what we're looking for is really solid calcium to be produced, which tells us automatically that if I were to write the half reaction for calcium on the product side, because I'm looking to produce it, it should be calcium with no charge. And my initial guy that I'm starting with, because I'm gonna basically dump in the calcium chloride is really calcium with a plus two charge. And you can see that calcium is going from plus two to zero, which means it's going through reduction, which means it has to gain electrons. And the plus two means that it lost two electrons. So in order to get back to its original state, it needs to gain two electrons. And this is your classic reduction reaction or your cathode, which is what we see down here. And you could do basically the same thing for the chloride if you were going to figure out chlorine. If you were going to figure out chlorine, you know you're going to produce chlorine. And again, what you're dumping in there is the chloride, which would have to be on the reactant side. And again, it's going from minus one to zero, which means that it is losing electrons, which is an oxidation. Each of those chlorides are going to lose one electron for two electrons. And that is how you could get down here. And again, because our electrons are on the product side, that's our anode. Now, the, the very simple way of doing it is just to go to the SRP table and find the appropriate half reaction and then flip it whichever way you need to get the solid on the correct side. Other questions on that? Okay, so we have this cell is running for uh, 0.452 amps. An amp, again, is a coulomb over a second. We also know we're running for 1.5 hours. So as I mentioned before, pretty much your time should get into seconds, so everything cancels out. So in an hour, there's like 3,600 seconds. So uh, 1.5 times 3,600 gives us 5,400 seconds. We're going to run this cell for. Again, the purpose of the seconds is so all these units cancel. So what you want to do is take the time that you ran the cell for. You want to multiply it by how the amperage you were running it at. The seconds here will cancel. And that's going to give us 2440.8. Coulombs. Now, once you get the charge that's happening in the cell, this is where you use your Faraday's constant. And it's the same constant that we use in all those other formats, 96,500 
coulombs per mole of electron. Kind of like a constant, this little part here. The coulombs are going to cancel. And that will give you the moles of electrons, which will be, we'll go with 0 0.0253. Zero point zero two five three moles of electrons. So again, time times the amperage gives you the charge for the cell. Charge divided by Faraday's constant gives you the moles of electrons. And now in this one, we are interested in calcium. So we want to go to the half reaction that involves calcium. And we see that for every two moles of electrons, we get one mole of solid calcium out. And we're gonna do kind of like a stoichiometry move here. We're gonna do two moles of electrons, gives us one mole of solid calcium. And we're gonna divide that by two, gives us 0 0.0126 moles of calcium. Now, if we want the grams of calcium, we're gonna take our 0 0.0126 moles of calcium. We're going to multiply it by the molar mass of calcium from the periodic table, 4008 grams per mole, I believe. Gives us something like 0 0.5, and eh, we'll go three, why not? 0 0.7 grams of calcium would be produced in this cell. So if I ran the cell for one and a half hours at that amperage, I should produce about 0.5 grams of calcium should come out. Any questions on any of those steps there? We could also do the exact same thing for the chlorine. If I want to know how many grams of chlorine would come out, the only difference is right here, this would be two moles of electrons and one mole of chlorine gas. And probably at that point, you might use something like the ideal gas law and figure out the volume of chlorine gas, or you could use the um, molar mass to figure out the grams of it. Any questions on that one? All right, so why don't you try one here? Let's see what you come up with, that one we skipped, which is this one. A cell is run at 1.26 amperage uh, through a cell containing sulfuric acid for 7.44 hours. Write the half cell reactions and calculate the volume of gases generated at STP. You hopefully remember STP is standard temperature and pressure. Temperature is 273 Kelvin. Pressure is one atmosphere. That is what STP stands for. So take a few minutes. I know we're towards the end. What we're just going to finish it up since it's the last example in this chapter. So we'll run a little long and we'll just take a little bit of break and start lab just a little bit later. So why don't we just finish this up so we don't have to kind of restart it in lab or finish it. All right, so take a few minutes and uh, we'll talk about it. You need to probably use the ideal gas law. And I'm going to give you the, uh, there's the overall reactions or the half reactions so you can pick it up uh, from that point. So. We want to know really the volume of hydrogen gas produced and the volume of oxygen gas produced at STP, which again is uh, standard temperature and pressure. <clears throat> so see what you come up with and we'll talk about it. And like I said, we'll just finish this one up and we'll start lab just a little bit later than normal. I'll just write the important stuff here. We ran this cell for 1.26 amperage for 7.44 hours was the volume of H2 and O2 at STP. All right.
let us uh, take a look here and see uh, what's going on. And we want to kind of start it the same way. In this case, we're given basically the amperage uh, for how long it's uh, for how it's running. We also have the time. So again, as I mentioned before, probably good move to always convert the time into seconds so everything cancels. So 7.44 hours. Again, in an hour, there's like 3,600 seconds. And <clears throat> if we do that, 26,784 seconds. So at this point, we could take our 26,784 seconds, our 1.26 coulombs per second, which is again, what the A equals, coulomb over seconds. The seconds will cancel and we will end up with 33,748 coulombs. So again, here we're going to uh, use Faraday's constant to convert that into moles of electron. So we're going to divide by 96.5 coulombs per mole of electron. And that will give us, yeah, we'll call it 0 0.350 moles of electron. Any questions up to the first part here? Now, again, as I mentioned before, it mentions only really sulfuric acid in the problem, and it really is the water electrolysis that we're looking at. So since we're interested in both the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas, we need to figure out the moles of each of those. So if we look at the half reactions for our oxygen, for every one mole of oxygen, we have four moles of electrons. Again, just like stoichiometry pretty much, right there and right there. When we look at the H2, which is here, there's actually a four on the outside, which if you multiply the four in, gives you two moles of H2 for every four moles of, oct of electrons. And that really is the same if you want as for every one mole of H2, you get two moles of electrons. So you could reduce that down if you want. You could keep it as, you know, a two to four relationship is going to mathematically come out the same. So we we're going to use these balanced half reactions to go from moles of electrons to moles of what we're interested in. So I'm going to put the page here. And by doing that, we're going to take uh, 0 0.5 three, five moles of electrons. And for every four moles of electrons, we got from the half reaction, one mole of O2, which will give us 0 0.0875 moles of oxygen. We'll do the same thing for the hydrogen because we're interested in that as well. And again, I'm going to use the one to two relationship. So one mole of H2 is the same as two moles of electrons. Again, you could do the four to two relationship if you want. Obviously, mathematically, it's going to come out the same. 0.175 looks like. So now that we're looking for really a volume of a gas, that again should lead you to the ideal gas law. So we're gonna solve for volume. Volume would equal NRT divided by P. And a reminder again that the STP is one atmosphere for the pressure and the temperature is 273. So we can plug all of our numbers in here. So if we do the volume uh, for oxygen, it is going to equal the moles we calculated above, 0 0.0875, R, which is 0 0.08206, temperature 273 because it's at STP, 
all divided by one atmosphere, which is our pressure at STP. And if we do all that good stuff there, we end up with 1.96 liters of O2 would be produced in this particular cell. Now we wanna do the same thing for our hydrogen because it also is a gas, but you could plug it back into the ideal gas law just like we did above. But you might also remember, perhaps from 1A, that when you are at STP and only at STP, one mole of any gas will equal 22.414 liters. So that's actually a conversion factor you could use and not use the ideal gas law. And we actually could use that. So we'll do that for hydrogen. So the volume of hydrogen would equal our moles and our conversion factor, which again, a reminder, can only be used in STP conditions. If it is not STP conditions, you better use the ideal gas law. So 0.175 times 22.414 gets you 3.92 liters of hydrogen gas. Again, if you stuck it into the ideal gas law like we did before, it would look exactly like the top one, except that this number would be the 0.175 number, should also end up getting the exact same answer as we've got here as well. So just a reminder of that little shortcut in case you forgot about it. Again, only at SCP conditions can you use that. Also does make sense based on what we talked about earlier. It looks like we got about four liters of hydrogen for every two liters of oxygen, that two to one ratio that we talked about in terms of the gas that's being produced here. As you remember in that little picture, there's a lot more hydrogen gas than oxygen gas. Any questions on that there? Or, yeah. There you go. Other questions or anything? Okay. So that does wrap up this chapter. Again, a reminder that our exam has been moved to the 22nd, which should be Wednesday, I think. And I believe, I'm 100% sure, but I believe this should be the last stuff that should be on the exam, I think. I'll double check, but I think that's the last stuff on it. Um, any questions on that? So today we're doing in lab something, uh, electrochemistry, I think. I wanna say experiment 18 seems right. Uh, so experiment 18, which is electrochemistry, which is all this stuff as well. So it shouldn't be too bad. I, I think it's a very short video today as well. So um, we'll take a little break since obviously we ran way over there. Um, let's go with, so why don't, we, why don't we start about 320? Let's go about 320-ish, yeah. Get up, stand, stretch, you know, move around and all that good stuff. Not good to sit for this long. So, uh, We'll start lab about 320, okay? In that, in that ballpark, 320, somewhere in that area. And we're going to be doing experiment uh, 18, which is electrochemistry. So if there's no other questions, make sure you put here if you didn't. Um, and then I'll see everybody again about 320 or so, okay?